This lecture is about the classification of matter. You're probably familiar with the basic definition of matter. It's that it is anything that has mass and takes up space. And so as you look around yourself in the room, everything you see represents matter, whether it's furniture, um, radio, a plant, and even things you don't see that are too small for you to see with the naked eye, like air. Air is made of particles that are mass. It's probably more challenging to try to come up with an example of something that is not matter. So think for a minute and see if you can perhaps come up with something that does not meet the qualifications for matter. If you said energy on the last page, you would be right. So light, for example, is a form of energy. It does not have mass, and it does not take up space, and so it, it does not represent matter. So the mo more common way to classify matter is by the state that the matter is in, the most common being solid, liquid, or gas. But we're going to fo focus more in this presentation on classifying matter by its composition primarily whether it is a pure substance or a mixture. I'm going to talk for just a couple minutes about the more common classification by state of matter. And, of course, the three common ones we're used to discussing are solid, liquid, and gas. Other than the obvious difference between a solid, liquid, and gas that we can see with our eyes, solids are very dense, um, gases are often we can't visualize them, and liquids are things that flow. Um, but other, beyond that, at a molecular level, understand that the key difference between these three phases of matter is the distance between the particles. So a solid, the particles are very close together. A liquid, they are moderately close. And a gas, the particles are pretty far apart. That affects all sorts of properties of a solid, liquid, and gas. Here's another visualization of the same thing. You can see that the particles of a solid are very tightly packed. That of a liquid, um, they're still pretty close together, but they do have room to slide past one another. And the particles of a gas are freely moving. So as a result of this, solids the particles of a solids can only vibrate. That is their only mode of motion. There's not enough room for them to move beyond each other. So because of that, a solid has a fixed volume. In other words, it's not compressible. And it also has a fixed shape because the particles cannot change places. The shape is also fixed. There are two types of sal solid. There's crystalline solid, and that is when the particles arrange themselves. Um, crystals, they're often very pretty, actually. The um, particles are arranged in a repeating, very defined, well-defined order. And that makes for a very hard, um, oftentimes very pretty sample. Amorphous solids are ones in which the particles of the solid are not arranged in any particular pattern. Um, and that would be things like glass and plastic. They tend not to be as hard. Liquid, on the other hand, if you remember the spacing between liquid molecules, they are still pretty close together, but there is room for the liquid molecules to slide, trade places and slide past one another, and because of that, liquids are able to flow. Because they're able to flow, they can change shape. So you can see here that we have 100 milliliters of water. It assumes the shape of whatever container it's put into. Okay? However, the volume is fixed. The volume does not change. If we start with 100 milliliters, regardless of the container we put it in, we are going to keep 100 milliliters. Gaseous molecules have a lot of space in between them. And so they have total freedom of motion. You can almost make the assumption in many gases 
that they're, that one particle doesn't even know the other part, any other particles are around. They are that free to move. Because of the space between the particles, a gas has a unique quality, and that is it is compressible. You take a gas and squish it down. That's what they do when they compress nitrogen, compress oxygen, when they have those pressurized tanks of gas. What I want to talk a bit more about in this lecture is the classification of matter by its composition. And so in this case, the major subdivisions are whether or not the matter is a pure substance or a mixture. Those names themselves are pretty descriptive. A pure substance must have only one thing in it. That one pure thing can either be a pure compound or a pure element. So water, for example, not tap water, but pure distilled water would be a pure substance. Tap water, on the other hand, would be a mixture. As soon as you add a second or third or fourth ingredient, you have a mixture. Elements are all the elements you can see in the periodic table. Those are also pure substances. Mixtures are what most of our world exists in. Okay? There are, in turn, two types of mixtures. There's the type that I say has lumps, bumps, or layers, and that is the heterogeneous mixture. And then there are homogeneous mixtures, which look the same throughout the sample. From the top to the bottom, they look like they only have are made of one thing, very uniform looking composition. So again, just to emphasize, a pure substance has only one thing in it. The composition of a, of a pure substance is unchangeable. So if you have distilled water, it's gonna be H2O no matter where you sample it. A pure substance can be broken down only by chemical means. So if you want to change a pure substance, you have to have some type of chemical reaction. Um, it's, you can't physically start plucking the hydrogen and oxygen atoms off. A mixture, on the other hand, is physically separable. It can be separated by physical means. It contains two or more components. The composition of the mixture is all over the place. So let's say that we're making iced tea, and you like your iced tea strong, and I like it weak. Well, we can have two glasses of iced tea with totally different ratios of tea to water. So mixtures have variable composition. All right, so talking about elements and compounds a bit more. This next statement can get a little confusing. So element, those are all the elements in the periodic table. So I might say, okay, magnesium. What if I said oxygen? You may not realize, or you might remember from high school chemistry, that oxygen is one of the diatomic elements. So that in nature, it exists Two, ox two oxygen atoms chemically bonded together. You will not see a single oxygen atom existing naturally in this world. Um, and so my question to you is, is oxygen an element or is it a compound? It's an element, okay? So what's the definition of a compound? It has to be made up of two or more different types of atoms. Okay, if the, if the two or more atoms are the same, it is still an element. Take a minute, see if you can identify what type of mixture I've shown in this diagram in the upper right. The first one is salt water. The question you should ask yourself, does the sample have lumps, bumps, or layers? No. Does it look the same at the top as it does at the bottom as it does in the middle? Yes, that means it's homogeneous. We can tell here we already have different colors, different textures, that is heterogeneous as are all rocks. Well, virtually all rocks. Water and oil, I see layers, okay? It's different composition at the top than it is at the bottom, so that is also hetero. 
Mud is hetero. They're definitely lumps and bumps. Alcohol and water, that'd be like a glass of wine or a glass of beer. It looks the same in the top as it does in the bottom, therefore that is a homogeneous mixture. And so is vinegar. Vinegar is a mixture of acetic acid and water, but it looks the same regardless of where you sample it. And another thing I want to point out here, I may have forgotten to add it here, is another a synonym, another name for a homogeneous mixture, is a solution. Okay, they mean one and the same. All right, as I said before, mixtures can be physically separated. And I want to talk over three or four different ways, common ways that chemists use to separate mixtures. So the easiest way is something we call decanting. And that's when you have a mixture of um, a liquid and solid, and the solid um, does not dissolve. And if the solid settles down to the bottom nicely, then you can just pour off or decant. A more sophisticated way to separate, if you have two liquids that are miscible, they dissolve in each other, and you want them separate, how are you going to do that if they don't separate on their own? One way is by distillation. Distillation separates by boiling point. So if you have this mixture, you heat it up, the lower boiling material will vaporize first. As it travels through the condenser or the cooling tube, it'll recondense into a liquid and be collected in this bottle over to the right. So you get a nice pure bottle of the lower boiling stuff and the higher boiling stays behind. Filtration is a separation method you'll use quite a bit in the lab and you may well already be familiar with it, but it's also for separating a solid and a liquid. But in this case, you either, let's say, want to do a better job of separating them, or perhaps you have a solid that does not settle out very well. So in that case, instead of just decanting off the liquid, you will pour the mixture through a funnel, and in the funnel you will have filter paper, that does a good job of holding all the solid particles back while the liquid flows down through the funnel. And finally, chromatography. That is primarily used to separate the components of colored, let's say, ink pens or paints. Um, as you know, most of the colors we use in our world are mixtures of multiple different colors. And so chromatography allows you to separate them out and see exactly what they consist of. So here we have started off with a black pen, and we do chromatography and see that it's got indigo and purple and some yellow. Um, and so how chromatography works is it has what we call a stationary phase. And in this example, I've shown the stationary phase is the paper just stationary meaning it's not moving. And there's also a mobile, a movable phase, and that is the liquid in the bottom of the container here. And so when you put the paper in with a sample spotted on it, the liquid will start wicking up the paper. And as it does, that liquid will carry bits of the solid or bits of the sample up with it. And the different components of that mixture of ink will have different affinities for the liquid that's traveling up the paper. So you can see here, for example, that the blue ink has a much higher affinity for the liquid. It wants to stay with it and leave the paper behind, whereas the purple is apparently sticking more to the paper. It has a higher affinity for the paper than the liquid. And so um, this is how chromatography works. And again, the um, forensics can use it to identify the type of ballpoint pen that was used. Um, that's probably the most common example I can think of. That's it for this lecture.